Well, welcome everybody to our uh, next LEARN session today. We have an introduction to hospice and we have Mike Briggs as our speaker and Fairway um, Mortgage Company as our sponsor. And so uh, we're going to talk just a little bit. Fairway has graciously um, agreed to sponsor our summer session of trainings. And this enables us to be able to bring you all of these sessions free um, and make sure that we have them recorded on our website for you so that you can go back and look at them. Or if you weren't able to attend today's session in person, you can always go to learnidaho.org and check them out there. So thank you again, Fairway. And then today's presenter is Mike Briggs. He's the Director of Community Relations at Keystone Hospice and an incredible con contributor to our community. Um, Mike is an Idaho native and has been working in healthcare since March of 2004. Um, he loves to provide solutions to patients and families that need help in the community he loves. Um, he's extremely passionate about hospice care and enjoys helping people understand why it's such a great benefit. He's been married to his lovely bride for 27 years. Hard to believe that, Mike. Um, neither you nor she looked that to have been married that long. Um, has four beautiful children, and Mike loves to coach wrestling and has done and has done for 31 sessions. He also loves to go camping, hunting, fishing, paddleboarding, workout, volleyball, and anything with his family. But Learn is a lifelong education and aging recess, resource network rep, Idaho-based nonprofit organization with a mission to provide quality community education on retirement and aging topics in the area of health, wealth, lifestyle, and caregiving. And LEARN is a member of the Leaders Network of the Society of Certified Senior Advisors. And then just a quick disclaimer before we move on to Mike, our content is provided for general informational purposes only and is not to be considered legal, financial, or health advice. Consult with your legal, financial, healthcare, or other service providers before taking action based on this information. And with that introduction, I would like to turn it over to Mike and I'm going to switch screens here and bring up Mike's presentation. So Mike, you are welcome to take it away. Fantastic. And uh, Dee, thank you for that uh, gracious introduction and um, you know, lots of the people on this call, I know, I know a lot of you, so I'm honored to be here today and privileged to speak to you about something that I'm super passionate about. Um, today, I got the opportunity, we were talking a little bit earlier, to um, take one of our patients out um, in, in a little motorcycle ride in a side-by-side -side and, and um, to see the emotion that she had in her face. Um, you know, it said more than words could say. And, you know, Eric Colette from A Mind for All Seasons, he's always talking about our, our uh, body language says a lot, um, especially for those folks that do have dementia. And um, her body language said a lot. And um, just thinking about it right now, again, yeah. gets me emotional about it. And I, I, I truly love what I do every single day. And it's an honor to be able to go out into our community and offer resources for the people that we care for, but also resources for the professionals that, that we work with. And we truly think that uh, we're blessed to be able to uh, partner with a lot of you out there um, and, and help you in finding solutions for your, for your loved ones or your, your clients or whoever it may be. So today is, is, it's really about, it's a hospice 101. It's really about living. Um, and that's something that we preach at, at Keystone. And, and I think any hospice out there would say the same thing. Everybody thinks that hospice is about dying and it truly isn't. It's about living the best that you possibly can until you take your last breath. And so that's something that we try to uh, convey to the families and to the patients that we take on. Um, go ahead and go to the, I think you can skip the next slide and go to the third one. Okay. So an overview of what we're going to talk about today is what is hospice and, and that's a no brainer. It's hospice 101 is the, is the title. Um, understand what the Medicare hospice benefit is, how the, how hospice works, um, hospice and uh, the, the facility relationships and communication, how important communication is in healthcare, 
um, really it, it, communication is important in every relationship that we have in life. Um, my relationship with my family, my wife, my kids, my relationship with my coworkers, my relationship with the people that I know that are on this call, the, the communication that we have back and forth is super important. So uh, we, we stress that a lot at Keystone. And, and typically one thing that I like to always tell people is uh, there's usually one more person you need to go and tell uh, what you just told to that person. You, there's usually another person to discuss that with. So um, moving on um, at the end, we'll, we'll have some time for questions um, and answers. But if you have a question that comes up, you, it, everybody should be a professional at Zoom by now. You can just throw it in the chat and I will check that periodically. Usually it'll pop up and I'll be able to answer them on the fly. So don't think that you can't uh, interject or have a question in sometime in there. Now this slide here is mo mostly, let me find my tongue, mostly about um, Keystone Hospice, what our mission statement is, what our vision and what our core values are. Um, th this training is more of what hospice is all about and not about Keystone, but um, if, if you ever offline want to know more about us and our mission and our vision and our core values, you can just call me. Go ahead to the next slide. So this is typically where Brandon Hoops, our administrator, uh, discusses the next few slides. So go ahead. Um, here's where we're going to talk really about what hospice is. So, so hospice is a philosophy of care that emphasizes the importance of living each day to the fullest in ways that are personal and meaningful and receiving support and guidance in learning to accept death as a natural part of life. I always tell people um, that we, you know, really in the way life is, birth and death are very, very similar. Um, in, in the birthing part, it's painful. Uh, it's, there's uh, a lot of emotion there is um, spiritual aspects to it. There's people's bodies that are going through things. And, and the same thing happens uh, when we're passing away. Uh, when, when, you know, that time comes that we take our last breath, it's painful. It's uh, a physical thing. It's an emotional thing. And it's a spiritual thing. And so um, that's a cool thing about hospice is we get to... Uh, treat the whole person, uh, body, mind, and spirit. And so um, the way that hospice is set up, that's, that's how it should work. And, and you'll get to know more about that um, later in the presentation. Hospice is wherever the patient calls home. So whether it be their physical home where they grew up in, or they've been married to their wife for 70 years, and that's where they've called home, that's where hospice is provided. If they're able to have the caregivers around and, and be safe, then they can stay at their home until they pass away. Today, I met with a family at St. Al's and um, the, the patient, all he wants to do is get home so he can be with his grandkids and be with his wife and his son and, and be with his family and surrounded by his loved ones. And that's really why hospice is so cool is we get to die the way we want to uh, and we get to live the rest of our life until we do take that last breath the way we want to. So it was very special to be able to meet with him today and, um, and his wife and, and get them all set up. Um, so the home is a place, the assisted living facilities can be a place they call home, um, certified family homes, and also skilled nursing facilities. Um, sometimes people even get hospice in the hospital. Um, if the hospice has a general inpatient contract with the hospital, they're able to provide that care in the hospital itself. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, a little bit of history about hospice. Um, the term hospice can be traced back to medieval times when it referred to a place of shelter and rest for weary or ill travelers on a long journey. So um, this isn't a, a a word that just came up. It's, it's something that's had long time uh, history. Um, the, the name was first applied to a specialized care for dying patients by physician Dame Cicely Saunders 
who began her work with the terminally ill in 1948 and eventually went on to create the first modern hospice, St. Christopher's Hospice in residential suburb, suburb of London. <clears throat> so a lot of hospice nurses, they look up to Cicely um, a lot. They kind of put her on the mountaintop. She's, she could be like on Mount Rushmore of hospice world. Um, these next few other ladies could be there too. Um, in 1974, with the help of two physicians, Florence Wald founded Connecticut Hospice in Brantford on the outskirts of New Haven. In the United States, hospice was originally run by volunteers, so strictly volunteers. It was still a interdisciplinary group. It was a physician, but they're all volunteers, a physician, a nurse, a CNA, a social worker, a chaplain, and then volunteers as well. So that's why today hospice, um, hospices are required to have at least five percent of all the hours that we provide for our patients need to be provided by hospice volunteers. So, so finding volunteers is a big deal. And my plan after I retire from Keystone is to be a hospice volunteer because it is very special uh, to be able to give back to these patients. And a hospice volunteer can do anything. Um, they can sing, they can uh, read books, they can play music, they can play cards, they can watch TV, they can sit bedside and hold their hand and just be a, a supportive presence for the patient. So a volunteer can do lots of things. In the United States, hospice was originally run by, oh, I said that already, sorry. And, and in the 1980s, Medicare authorized the formal hospice care. They actually made it a benefit so that people can get the care um, through, through Medicare. So Medicare pays 100% for the services that we provide. Go ahead, Dee. So here's another lady that would be on the Mount Rushmore of hospice. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She was a social worker. Um, and I think she had some other uh, professions that she also practiced. But in 1969, she wrote the book on death and dying. And it is credited with the expansion of the hospice movement. So because she wrote that and people read it, that's how hospice really expanded and grew um, in all over. I would say not just only in America, but all over the world. Uh, the book on death and dying, if, if you're interested in reading it, you should definitely do that. Um, in the class we taught this morning for nursing students at Carrington College, there was a few in the class that have already read it. And then the teacher of the, uh, or the professor, she said she read it and that it's a really good book. I personally haven't, but it's got to be on my list to read. Um, so it took death out of secrecy and, and put it into public awareness and discussion for the first time, really. Um, a lot of us don't like to talk about death, but um, the people that work in hospice, we do talk about the process and um, how it's a special time. It's, it's a new journey for the people um, that are going on. Um, so... Um, the book stated that care in the home was prefer preferable over institutional care, just like the, the family that I met with today, they would absolutely rather be in, the, in their home than be there in the hospital. And um, so that's great. We're able to help those people get to their home. And that's our goal really with, with, with hospice. N no hospice agency in the Valley wants to see people die in the hospital. Um, now, sometimes families prefer that. That's fine. We, we want people to have their wishes granted and be able to um, pass in the hospital if that's what they want. But, but our goal is definitely to get them home and to get them surrounded by the people that, that love them and, and people that care about them. And it's argued that patients should be able to participate in decisions regarding their treatment. So it's super important. Um, every time we meet with a family, uh, we tell them they're the boss and they're, they, we just tell them parameters that we have. We tell them um, you're the boss and you tell us, you know, how you want things to look when you're in your, your home and how you want your room to look and the people that you want in the room when you pass and all those certain things. We have those discussions and um, it's, it's very special for us to be able to share that with the patients and their families. 
goals of hospice care. So the, the main goal is, is palliative care, not curative. And it's aimed to, to relieve um, people from suffering and enhancing their quality of life. That's why we always say it's really about living. It's, it's living the best that you possibly can until you take your last breath. And our number one goal is to make sure that you're comfortable. That's why uh, we do a lot of the things that we do in hospice. Um, it's, it's all about the patient's comfort. So when we tell the patients that they're the boss, they truly are. When they say, hey, I'm in pain, my pain's at eight out of 10, we're on top of it, making sure that it doesn't get there again. And we make sure that we take care of them. Um, pal palliative care manages physical pain social suffering and spiritual pain. So earlier when I was talking about the whole person, the body, mind, and spirit, that's why there's an interdisciplinary team where the, the nurse and the CNA typically take care of the physical part, the social worker and the chaplain take care of the social part and the spiritual part. And we don't just help the, the patients out, we also help their whole family out. So everybody that's involved is part of the care plan. Everybody is, is part of the discussion and helping us out. Um, a lot of people have the misnomer that hospice hastens death, but it doesn't. Um, it, it actually helps people get comfortable so their bodies can relax so that they can, but it's not to hasten it and it's not to lengthen it. But typically patients that come on to hospice services that have the same diagnosis as another person they live 29 days longer usually than the person that doesn't choose hospice. So it's really important for people when they have to have that diagnosis of six months or less to know that what hospice is all about, to really understand how it can benefit them and how it can help them. A few more primary goals, um, supporting and, and guiding patients and families through the difficult interpersonal and psychosocial issues and helping them with finding closure. It's a huge part of that the social worker does and what the chaplain does in the conversations that they're having with the patient and with their family members. Um, respecting the personal, religious, spiritual, and cultural values. So we have patients that come on that are Buddhists, uh, Jewish, um, Christian, um, some that don't even believe in God. So we respect them where they're at spiritually, and we just come alongside them and help them out where they're at. Assisting patients and families reaching financial closure, closure. So our social workers really help out with the living will, the trust, the advanced directives, and the funeral home arrangements. Um, they, the social worker is a vital aspect of the team that really helps out in a lot of different ways. Number one, they go in and they get the life story, life history of our patient, and then they share that with the team so that we really understand the history of this person so that we can better care for them. And then providing the bereavement counseling to the mourning loved ones after the death of the patient for at least 13 months after they've passed. So it's a vital point uh, to know that, you know, um, my nurse was talking this morning in this conversation when we were doing this presentation to the other nurses at Carrington. Um, when she first got into hospice, she's like, why are we admitting this patient? They're gonna die in the next 24 hours or they're gonna die in the next three days. Really, in all honesty, number one, first for that patient, for their signs and symptoms, but second of all, for the bereavement aspect of it, to be able to follow up with those family members. There, it happens so often that in nursing homes, a lot of patients pass away without hospice care. Well, the nursing homes don't do bereavement care. So then that family misses out on that bereavement support that they would get for 13 months after they pass away. So it's super important for people that are in skilled nursing facilities to know that hospice is an option for them while they're in their nursing home. So bereavement support, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. I know I have loved ones that have been on our service and I've talked to our families, my personal families, and they say, gosh, chaplain so-and-so called me, uh, the, so, the social worker called me, um, they keep calling me and they're keeping up on me and they care about me and they wanna make sure that I'm doing well. So it's, it's a vital aspect of what hospice is all about. Go ahead, Dee. So what hospice is, um, is not and what hospice does not do. So hospice is not only for the last three days of life. It, it can be 
um, for for up to a year. If if somebody is showing decline and they still meet the criteria, then they still um, belong on hospice. They can live discharge and then be off the hospice for three or four months and then come back because they had an event or that something changed where they starting to decline again. So it, it's not just for the last three days. It, it can be for longer. Hospice is not a physical place where patients go to die. Hospice is, like we said earlier, it's, it could be in their home. It could be in an assisted living community. It can be in a skilled nursing facility. Hospice is not only for cancer patients. So when it first began in America, that's truly what it was mainly for, is for cancer patients, but it's evolved. And later on in the presentation, there'll be a whole list of diagnoses of, of folks that we, we can help with those diagnoses. Hospice does not deal only with pain management. It, it deals with a lot of aspects of going through the process of, of, of declining and, and until we take that last breath. Hospice does not discriminate based on age, gender, race, or religion. We are truly there to support them however they want. And like I keep saying, they're the boss. They truly are. And we respect them. We can't interject our own opinions. We can give them, we can give them options, but we can't say, well, this is what I would do. Um, unless they ask that specifically and say, hey, what would you do if this was your mom? Then we can answer those more pointed questions, but uh, we, we don't discriminate. Hospice does not participate in or encourage youth, euthanasia. So some people think that we can do that, but obviously in the state of Idaho, that's not an option. When I worked at Legacy Hospice, we had patients in Oregon and in Oregon, we were able to, to do that. So, so that, that is true to, to some aspect, but in Idaho, it does not participate in that. Why choose hospice? Hospice provides the care that most Americans say they want. They, they want to pass away in their own homes, they want to be pain-free, and they want to absolutely be surrounded by their loved ones. We did an uh, uh, exercise at work where we wrote down the things that we would want in our room when we're passing away. And, um, you know, I absolutely want my family there. I want my kids, I want my wife. Now, if they don't want to be there, that's fine, but I want them to be there. Um, um, to, to be with me when I, when I leave this earth and go to heaven. So, I, you know, I think it's, it's something that I prefer, but not everybody prefers that. Some people may say, no, I don't want anybody in the room. Um, we had a patient um, in the spring that uh, didn't have a loved one that lived here locally. And so we sat vigil for four, day, four days, 24, 24 hours, um, for four days until she passed. And um, I was privileged to be there when she took her last breath. It was a beautiful moment for her to leave. And um, it, it, was, it was an honor to be there with her. Most patients and families say that they, that they want to. And, and, you know, we've covered that. They, they want to be home. They want to be in their surroundings. Um, and, and I think that uh, Sue said that the, the percentage this morning was like in the 90 percentile people want to pass in their own home. So here, here's a list of a lot of the different diagnoses that um, people can qualify for hospice. Again, it comes down to a medical, direct, uh, medical doctor um, saying that this person has less than six months to, to live and they have one of these diagnoses. Then they qualify for hospice. Go ahead. So here, here we go more on the criteria part. So the initial certification has to be approved by two physicians. It has to be the hospice medical director and then the PCP or an oncologist for that, that patient. And um, once that is taken place, that, that, that's part of the process. Um, the patient and the family choose a palliative plan uh, of care rather than a curative. So the, the family wants to um, like I just got a call on my way home after the, the motorcycle ride of a patient that's homeless. Um, he's at St. Al's and he, want, he, he doesn't want to do any more treatment. He wants hospice. So tomorrow, myself and a nurse, we're going to go meet with him 
and we're going to help him get placed in an assisted living facility, but we're also going to help him with the hospice care. Can you believe it? I already got a place for him. He's a Medicaid homeless patient. We're going to get him placed. So I'm pretty excited about that. Nice. Um, the, the patient lives within the hospice service area. So um, every hospice in the Valley has a service area. And typically the Medicare rules and regulations, you have to be within 60 miles of your lo your physical location. So we, we service um, Ada, uh, Canyon and Boise and Gem counties. Sometimes we dabble a little bit in Owyhee County. So we took a patient on last night in Owyhee County. And then they have to have a primary caregiver in the home. Now, sometimes we've taken on patients, they don't have anybody. They don't have somebody in the home so then we work automatically on trying to get them placed. Um, for instance, the gentleman I just talked about that we're going to meet with tomorrow, our goal is to get him placed in an assisted living facility so he's in a safe environment for him. Um, but we have taken care of people in the homeless shelter because they're in a place, those, those places are able to house them um, and, and we can care for them there. Um, but our goal is to get them to an assisted living or a certified family home or, or place somewhere where there is a primary care uh, person. Go ahead, Dee. So typically this next uh, bit of slides, Lenny Jensen, our, our um, president, um, founder of, of Keystone, he, he goes over this part. Um, and, and a lot of you got people know Lenny. Lenny is an amazing man that, uh, that just, I love working for him and he inspires me every day to do the very best at what I do. So here we go. How, who pays for hospice? So me Medicare pays 100% for hospice and that typically um, on a Kate, you know, like on our, our list of patients, it's about 83% of the patients that we care for. Medicare is paying for that. But Medicare pays 100% for the hospice care. Medicaid pays 100% for hospice care. They typically are about 5% of our caseload. Um, and, then, and then private insurance also pays for hospice care. And typically the people have to meet their deductible, but usually when they have a diagnosis um, and they are on commercial insurance, they've already met that deductible because they've been on chemo or whatever. They've been in the hospital a bunch of times. They've already met that deductible. So then the private insurance pays the rest of their hospice care typically. Um, and then usually on our services, we, Lenny likes to have our um, ability to take on pro bono patients, at least 1% of ours. Um, I know that I think, I think these numbers here are, are maybe for the whole entire nation. I'm not sure exactly, but for our census, we have about three, one uh, percent usually. But right now, we don't have anybody that's pro bono on our services. So the Medicare beneficiaries must elect the Medicare hospice benefit uh, to to go on to hospice, and and they do that um, when they're they're signing the paperwork, um, and and so they agree to forego the Medicare coverage for conventional treatment for their terminal illness. So once they sign on to hospice, they're saying that I'm done going to the hospital. I'm done um, seeking curative things. And so then the hospice benefit kicks in. And But that doesn't mean that once they go into hospice, they can't ever go back to the hospital. There are circumstances where they can revoke and go back into the hospital if something happens, like they fall and break a hip and, the, and they can withstand a surgery and get a penny and then they can come back on the hospice. Medicare continues to cover items and services unrelated to the terminal illness. So they continue to pay for certain things not related to the terminal diagnosis. Go ahead, Dee. Medicare uh, payment for hospice. Um, the daily rate um, for every hospice provider in this valley, we all get paid the very same. So um, we get a daily rate. It's not um, you get a certain amount for a visit. It's every day we get a certain amount of money. And then however we want to use that money by different uh, programs that we offer, that, that's up to us. Um, so um, that's kind of how that works. The hospice assumes all the financial risk for costs and services associated with the care related to the patient's terminal illness. 
services provided under the Medicare hospice benefit. So this dives deep into all the things that we provide for people when they come on to hospice. So um, um, no matter what, you know, whatever the patient, every patient that comes on to our services is different. So everybody is different, but this is what the benefit um, pays for. It, it pays for the routine assessments and the evaluation, the nursing visits, the, the chaplain visits, the social worker visits, the hospice aid, all the volunteers, any additional personnel. So with us, we have a music therapist, an acupuncturist, and um, two massage therapists. So that's part of what we want to provide for our patients. So that's one of the additional things that we provide, but it's not mandatory by Medicare for us to do those things. Um, and our music therapist, uh, it's pretty phenomenal what she does. It's not, it's not entertaining music, but it's music pertaining to what's going on with that patient sitting in front of her bedside. And she gets their blood pressure. She looks at their, their breathing and she starts playing um, according to what she's getting from the patient. And it's really special. Um, all the medications, all the DME and all the medical supplies. So like the, the wipes, the gloves, the uh, depends, the, the pads that we put under the patients, um, the glycerin swabs, all those things that we provide is all part of the Medicare benefit. Go ahead, Dee. Um, curative treatment. So generally therapies that are thought to be a cure for the underlying hospice condition are not offered. So like chemotherapy, radiation, blood transfusions, dialysis. So typically um, if somebody's on dialysis, um, that's a curative thing and, and they are not appropriate for hospice. When they have chosen to stop doing dialysis, then they are appropriate for hospice. We had a patient and, this, and he literally said he was a miracle. He went to the dialysis center and said, I'm, I'm your miracle. He actually stopped dialysis. He was doing it three times a week and he lived for a whole month after he stopped dialysis. And um, it was because he had a huge family and man, they prayed a lot and he, he was just special. Uh, but it was pretty cool for, for us to be able to witness that and to be a part of his story. Um, but also there's chemotherapy, um, you know, there's radiation, all those things are curative. Those, those are typically, if, if somebody wants to continue to do that, they're not appropriate for hospice yet. And in some rare cases, such uh, therapy is offered to relieve intractable symptoms for palliative reasons. So sometimes we're, we have the ability to do palliative radiation, but it's all on a case by case situation. And that's something that's approved by Lenny and our administrator, Brandon. Go ahead. So there are four types of hospice care and or four levels of care is what I, I like to call them. Um, routine home care is probably 95% of the patients we have on our services right now. And, and I would say that's probably the same for all the hospices in the Valley. Most of our patients are on routine home care. So they're getting uh, nursing visits like um, two to three times a week. Their bath aids coming out two to three times a week. Their chaplain and social worker are coming out once a month or, or once a week or whatever the patient needs. So that's typically what the routine home care looks like. Um, and, and most of our patients stay on that the whole entire time they're on hospice. The next level of care is respite care. And respite care is pretty amazing for those folks that are at home and, they're, and their primary caregivers are their family members and their family members need a break or they wanna go on a vacation, then this level of care respite gives them that opportunity to do that. And it has to be done in a certified Medicare facility that has nursing 24 seven. So a lot of people think that they can, a lot of hospices say that you can do respite in assisted living. Well, not, not really. Um, for the hospice Medicare benefit, you, you, it has to be in a certified Medicare facility that has nursing 24 seven. So for it to go to happen in an assisted living, the family would have to pay for the room and board. So when they, they choose respite and they go in a nursing home, the hospice is paying for that visit, that transport to, to the 
the skilled nursing facility and then all the all of that five days of care that they're getting. But we're also still continuing to make visits in the nursing home. It doesn't stop because they went into the nursing home. The hospice still continues to do the care that they were doing as the routine home care. It's just in a different location. So respite care is, is really for the family, the primary caregivers to be able to get away and have break, to have respite for, for a five day period. Now, if somebody chose to go to an assisted living, um, the family chose to, and they'll pay privately, then they can do that. Um, but that can be however long the family wants to pay for that. Sometimes I've seen it where they say, let's put them in that uh, assisted living, and then they stay there uh, because the family just, it, it was easier for them and, and they were able to accommodate that. But typically respite is 100% in skilled nursing facilities. Um, the next level of care, continuous care. So this is where somebody has intractable pain or uncontrollable pain, and they need a nurse in the home to provide um, continuous care for up to eight hours. And 51% and of it has to be done by an RN. It can be an LPN as well, but that can be 49%. But 51% has to be from an RN. And then the whole goal there is to get their signs and symptoms under control and get them um, managed so that they're not in pain. So recently we had a gentleman that needed continuous care and our nurse was there for um, eight hours working on getting the pain under control and was able to finally do that. And then he came off of continuous care and continued to stay on routine care. So continuous care can be done in an assisted living facility or in the home. The last level of care, general inpatient care, um, doesn't really happen a whole lot either, uh, but there are times when it is appropriate. And that's again, when the, the signs and symptoms are out of control and, and this patient needs more uh, hands on deck. So it's typically done in a skilled nursing facility or in the hospital. So the setting is a little different. Medicare pays a different rate. Medicare pays a different rate for continuous care as well. And Medicare pays a different rate for respite and pays a different rate for routine care. But those are the four levels of care um, that hospice uh, provides. Now, again, just a reminder, if you have questions, you can go ahead and throw them in the chat and I'll answer those questions. Um, the defined benefit periods. So the way hospice is set up, there are two 90-day um, cert certification periods and that gets us to that six month period. Um, and then after that, those two 90 day cert periods, there are 60 day cert periods and they are every 60 days after that. So one thing that hospice does every 14 days, we have an IDG meeting and that's the interdisciplinary group meeting. So that means the doctor, the RN case manager, LPN, the uh, social worker, the um, chaplain, they all meet in a room and go over every single one of our patients. So tomorrow is our IDG day. So our medical director comes in and they all sit around a table and it's like they put the patient on a chair in the middle and they focus on that patient and they all talk about the care specifically for that patient. So because of that, the medical director, when it comes to to that, those 60 day cert periods, the medical director or a nurse practitioner has to go and do a face-to-face -face visit. That's what's required by Medicare for that doctor or that uh, nurse practitioner to go and lay eyes on that patient to make sure that that day that they're looking at them, that they would not be surprised if in the next six, six, or next six months that that patient would pass away. And they're still making that slow decline, they still qualify, then they recertify them. So. Um, that, that's kind of how that works. And a patient can live discharge or they can revoke services at any time. So let's say, like I was talking the scenario earlier about somebody falls and breaks their hip and they need to have surgery um, because it's fractured and um, the family, sometimes the families choose not to do surgery, but sometimes they do because the doctor's saying, oh yeah, they can handle it. So then they do have that. They, they pin them. They're in the hospital for two or three more days. And then we help them get them back home. And then they come back onto hospice. But they have to sign revocation period papers, sorry, 
they have to sign those revocation papers to come off a of hospice, then Medicare will pick up the hospital stay and then they can sign back on. But, but we don't want to do those things. Like some people think they can just sign off and then go back on and come off and go. That's not what the, the revocation is for. The revocation is for truly a person that either they, they want to go back to the hospital because they want to seek treatment or because they, they had something happen where they truly need to re revoke from the services. And then sometimes people live discharge because they got better or they just stayed, they plateaued and they stayed chronic for a very long time. Then we discharge them. And then typically some event that happens somewhere down the road and then they get back on our services. Some people say, well, then do they lose that benefit? No, the hospice benefit will still work for uh, that patient. They don't lose it because they've been on hospice before. Go ahead, Dee. So here are some general guidelines for hospice. Um, hospice is recommended for a patient with a terminal diagnosis and they have less than six months to live if the, uh, the disease runs its normal course. So none of us are um, predictors or we don't have a crystal ball when we know exactly what time, but doctors are trained and nurses are trained to know somewhere about with their education, they can make a determination of yeah, it wouldn't shock me if this patient passed away within the next six months um, if, it, if the disease ran its course. Um, hospice eligibility should not be confused with length of service as there is no time limit to hospice services. So kind of back to what I said earlier, um, there's no time limit. If, if somebody still is meeting that deep, they're still meeting that little tiny decline, either the, the, they've lost more weight, their mid-arm circumference is shrinking. Um, they're still meeting criteria because they're bed bound or, I mean, there's lots of different things that would still make somebody uh, uh, continue to uh, certify and recertify. We, we had a gentleman that was told to, uh, a year and a half ago that he was gonna pass before October and he's still on our services, but he has stage four cancer with METS in his body and he's still on our services, but he's getting much closer now. Um, eligibility is based on disease specific criteria and the patient's functional abilities and physical signs and symptoms. So when we go to look at a patient, we, we have, you know, what we have on their, um, you know, their paperwork telling us what is going on and then we go and lay eyes on them. And, and when we put that together to paint the picture to qualify them, then that's when we're like, oh yeah, this person totally qualifies. Sometimes it's really hard to qualify somebody. Um, so Dara wrote the question, how many times a week does a hospice usually come to a person's home? So that's an excellent question. So, so typically, so again, everybody is different. So everybody's care plan is different, but typically, I'll, I'll do the typical scenario first. Two, two to three times a week is what the RN and the hospice nurse will go, the hospice nurse, sorry, and the, and the bath aid will typically go out two to three times a week. The care that we provide is intermittent care. We're not there 24 hours a day. We're there intermittently. And when we're there, we're usually there for about an hour, but sometimes we're there longer because the patient needs us to be there longer. And then our chaplain and our social worker usually go out there once a month, but they can go out there weekly if the patient and the family need us to be there weekly. Um, so some patients though, as they progress and we get closer, they go to daily visits. So that means the RN and the CNA are going out there every single day uh, because they need us to be there every single day. And um, so it just depends on the signs and symptoms of what's going on with the patient and how they're progressing. As a, as a general guideline, hospice is recommended for a patient. Oh, we've done that. Go ahead, D, to the next slide. So admission criteria. We kind of talked about that a little bit, uh, but the initial certification for hospice requires the approval of two PCPs uh, or two doctors. Our, our doctor and the uh, PCP or the oncologist or the hospitalist, uh, they, they have to agree that this patient meets criteria. The patient and family choose to go the palliative route instead of curative. And then the patient lives within our area and, they're, and they have a primary caregiver available. Go ahead, Dee. 
What if the, the hospice beneficiary resides in a nursing home? Well, we've kind of talked about that already. Me Medicare will totally um, take care of our services, but then if somebody goes on um, as they're in the nursing home, then either Medicaid pays for their, their room and board in that um, nursing home, or the family pays privately. So it, hospice can totally be done in a nursing home and it, it should be done in a nursing home. Um, sometimes it, 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 it boggles my mind how some facilities just, they say, oh, well, we can provide that, but they don't provide the bereavement support afterwards. And I think that's a very important piece to it. Um, there just must be a contract between us and the skilled nursing facility. So every hospice has to have those contracts. The Medicare hospice benefit does not cover room and board. And so that's why it's either Medicaid or uh, private pay. So there was another question. Um, can I ask a physician to evaluate for hospice or do I need to wait for a visit physician to suggest? Another great question. So um, I would encourage everybody to ask their physician um, if they feel like like they're getting closer and they just need more care, then that's the opportune time for the loved ones or the patient to say, hey, I, I'd like to talk to a hospice. Can we see if a hospice can evaluate me to see if I qualify for hospice? And they can absolutely do that. And I would encourage that. Um, it doesn't always have to be initiated by the doctor. The, the, a lot of times, some of the doctors don't feel comfortable talking about death and dying. And so, um, it, it's totally cool if the, the, either the family members or the patients say, hey, I would like a hospice to check me out to see if I qualify for hospice. Great question. Go ahead, Dee. Okay, so this part of the, the slides is typically done um, by our, our hospice lead, Sue Murphy. So, um, but obviously I'm doing it today. So I, I'm fortunate to know this stuff anyways. Uh, but, but how does it work? Um, how does the, the generating of the referral happen? So typically, there's a few things that happen. The family um, calls us sometimes and say, hey, I'd like you to come out and evaluate my loved one for hospice. Can you do that? Well, who's the PCP? Uh, what's the diagnosis? All that stuff. So once we find out who the doctor is, we suggest to them to call the doctor and ask them to, to send a referral to us. But we'll also do that. I think it, it, it speeds up the process when the family asks, and then it doesn't look like we're ambulance chasing as a hospice agency. It, it really, I, th I think it goes a long way when the family asks or the assisted living facility um, asks before we do, but then we will follow up with a fax or, or a phone call to that primary care doctor to, uh, to get that order. Um, the hospital refers us, uh, or the facility staff or the family, like I talked about earlier. Uh, then we do the eval or the, the explanation of benefits, the EOB. So typically the RN case manager and myself or one of our other community liaisons, Jesse or Abby, will go with one of our RN case managers that would typically be the nurse for that patient. We'll go up to the hospital and we'll meet with them to give that explanation of, of benefits or we go to their homes because sometimes these people are already in their home and they just want us to come out and, and do that explanation of be benefits. But at that same time, the nurse is evaluating that patient, trying to see how they can qualify them. Um, it helps us a lot when we can lay eyes on the scene. And, and then as we're explaining all that, they get to, to know how, that, how hospice works. And essentially we, we do a lot of the things we're we're saying right now in this presentation. And then, and then we admit them to hospice once they say, I'm not doing curative things anymore. I don't wanna to go to the hospital anymore. I'm ready to, to just be comfortable and stay in the comforts of my home. Then we get uh, the admission set up and typically we have our RN case manager, our social worker and our chaplain show up at the admission. Um, they sign the paperwork and then the reason why we send three out is because then they don't have to send, say their message over and over multiple times. So that's why we do that. And then I would say that our hospice and, and from my experience working at other hospices, I would say that 95% of our patients have the chaplain in their homes because we send our chaplain out at the beginning. And, you know, some people say, well, I already have a pastor. I already have a bishop. I already have, 
my spiritual advisor. But once they get to meet our, our chaplain and they understand that the chaplain's just there to come alongside them where they're at spiritually, they, they're like, yes, please. And, and, and we want you there, but, but we also want our pastor or our bishop or our whoever to be involved. And that can totally work. It, it has no problems. So we get that paperwork signed if they're appropriate uh, to get started on services. And then we go from there. <clears throat> so the care team, I kind of talked about that already. It's the, the doctor, um, the PCP, um, can, the attending physician can still follow the patient um, if they choose to, and some have in the past. But a lot of the times they just want our medical director to take over because at two o'clock in the morning, they don't want that phone call. They'd rather us call um, Dr. D, Dr. Danae, or Dr. Connor. So, but they have every right to continue to have their medical director as they're, as they're attending while they're on hospice services. They don't have to go with our medical director. A lot of the times the medical director or the PCP just wants us to stay in communication so they know what's going on with the patient. Um, and then we have the RN case manager, the LPN, social worker, chaplain, hospice aid, volunteers. And then at Keystone, we have a different um, person that's part of our care team, and that's our veterans coordinators. Not every hospice in the Valley, well, not very many hospices, period, in the nation have veterans coordinators. So because we're veteran owned, uh, Lenny wants uh, veterans talking to veterans, and it makes a huge difference for our veteran um, uh, patients. And then, and then a really amazing part of that um, is that they, they say things to us they don't even say to their family. So it, it really relieves a lot of the burden that the patient, the veteran has. So our veterans coordinator is a big piece of the puzzle of, of our care team at uh, Keystone. Go ahead, Dee. Um, the complementary alternative medicines or therapies that we were talking about earlier, uh, massage therapy, acupuncture, aromatherapy, pet therapy. We have dogs that go out. Um, we have a, a Rottweiler that goes to the veteran's home with, with CJ when she sees her patients there. And then, and then that music therapist that I was talking about earlier. Um, these can really benefit our patients in reducing the amount of medications they're taking, especially the massage therapy, man. Today, when I went and met with that family in the hospital, the patient goes, I, his eyes got this big and he goes, I want massage therapy. So I, I called the clinical team assist and I said, make sure you put that in the email to the, the, to the nurse that's admitting him to make sure that they get massage out there as soon as possible. Go ahead, Dee. Um, services that are possible in conjunction with hospice. So um, you can still get wound care, you can still get uh, PCS services and you can get physical therapy Typically, when physical therapy gets involved, um, it's to go out there and help for safe transfers to educate the caregivers and to also um, educate the, the patient um, on safety measures. And, um, um, and then also um, make sure that our caregivers are safe, not only safety for the patient, but safe, safety for our patients, um, or I mean the caregivers that are providing the 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 services to be able to help them transfer from the bed to the chair. Um, and then sometimes we have to have a speech therapist come out to do a swallow eval. Sometimes that needs, but we contract to do those things. And then D uh, just asked a, a question about uh, what PCS services are available. So that's personal care services. So it could be um, 24 hour care through like home watch caregivers, home care assistants. I know a lot of you guys uh, are familiar with these companies. Um, but that can be the personal care services that I'm talking about that can work hand in hand. They're just another part of the care team that goes in there. And typically we'll, we'll work closely with the, the, the home care uh, agency that's going in there to, to help. Ser services that are not possible in conjunction with hospice um, are home health, um, re rehab uh, in a skilled nursing facility, it's definitely a huge conflict with, um, with um, you know, it's, it's seen more as curative. Now, home health can't completely be ruled out. Sometimes home health can be in conjunction, as long as it's not 
pertaining to the diagnosis of what the patient is on for. Um, here's another question. Um, uh, just to, important to explain, they are not covered under hospice. Oh, okay, great, D. I understand what you're saying. So yeah, so typically when somebody's getting 24-hour care, that's not covered by the hospice agency. That's trick. That's strictly private pay. Um, Medicaid pays for it or long-term care insurance pays for it. Thank you, D. That's a really good uh, clarification to understand that the hospice doesn't uh, pay for the 24-hour care or the eight hours a day or the four hours a day or whatever that they're having caregivers come in to care for them. Go ahead to the next one. So I talked about this earlier, the IDG group meets for every 14 days. So the interdisciplinary group, that's what that IDG stands for. Um, and, and it's composed of the care team. Um, and and the, again, they meet to discuss what we're doing we specialize everybody's care plan for them. And we, and we discuss if the pay, what, what level of care where they're at. Are they active? Are they, um, are they transitioning? Um, what's the overall plan of care for this patient? Um, and then that's our opportunity to discuss details with our physician. Now, one thing that's really cool about our medical uh, directors is that we have the opportunity to call them at any time of the day or night and we get a, we get an answer and we get the help that we need our rn case managers get the the help they need but they really work in a a lot of autonomy um so the doctors really trust those rns to make great decisions but if the the rn needs a little more help and guidance then she can call our our physician and get that um it's it's a great a great um, part of the team. Um, our medical directors are amazing. Medications, uh, we, we have the e-kit meds and that's for the comfort medications, anti-anxiety and anti-nausea medications that are in the e-kit. So that's the emergency kit. Those are the same medications that they would use in the ER. So uh, that's very important. Uh, bowel care meds, uh, pain management, anxiety medications and, and medications relating to their diagnosis. Those are all what hospice covers. Now let's say they're getting, they're taking something that, that isn't part of their diagnosis. Medicare still pays for that medication. It doesn't change, but Medicare pays us to cover all of the medications that are pertaining to their diagnosis. And then all of those that are listed. Go ahead to the next page. So end of life education. This is where our nurses are always communicating uh, the signs and symptoms of what's going on and, and where the, the patient is at. We have a resource booklet that we give to every family and page 43 through 45 goes on all the signs and symptoms as we get closer to the end of life. So our nurse is always providing that education piece of where they're at, where they're transitioning, where they're active, where they're passing, and, and what happens next. So that's discussed by the RN, and, and um, she's always educating the, the families and the patient on what's going on and where they're at in the process. Go ahead. Another cool uh, part of the bereavement care that we provide, uh, we do uh, bereavement classes um, or we call them bereavement community, but it's bereavement support group that meets at our office. We do them in eight week sessions and we're getting ready to start one on August 10th. And that can be for anybody. It doesn't have to be for somebody that's been on our services. So if you need information on the bereavement support, um, I'll get that to Dara and I'll, I'll get that sent out. Um, but, but we also provide uh, bereavement support, not only for the family, but for the staff at the facility, at the nursing home or at the, the um, assisted living community. And then the bereavement bears, that's a really um, cool part. We have a volunteer that's made over a thousand bears already in the six years that we've been open. And um, the bears that you see on the screen, those are my favorite bears because those are from a gentleman that refereed um, high school wrestling for over 43 years in the Valley. And he was a friend of mine. And uh, those are my favorite bears because they, they're wrestling bears. But we took his shirts and we created those bears for his family members. Um, and um, it, it's just 
pretty amazing that we have somebody that's willing to just volunteer her time um, to do that. Um, go ahead, Dee. Um, the hospice and the facility relationship. So that's where uh, the community liaisons come into to play. And that's where our number one goal is always about the patient and the care that they're getting provided. Um, we, we are this, we're on the same team as the facility. We like to tell them that we just come alongside and we're partners in the care for this um, loved one that, that the family is, is entrusting us to care for. And like I said at the very beginning, communication is a key part of this. Making sure that the, com the community and us are meeting on a regular basis, making sure that we are all on the same page um, because sometimes it can be where it's a he said, she said, and it, it doesn't go well for the patient. If, and it's really not about us. It's about, it's about the patients. Number one, the patients and the families are number one. And we want to make sure that we're communicating well with our communities so that we can give that very best care. And then what more can we do for, for the, the families, for the facilities, for the, that patient? We're always asking those questions to our our communities that we're partnered with. Go ahead, Dee. All right, we are at the end. So now you guys can unmute and you can ask questions. Um, so Dee just put um, that I mentioned uh, palliative care and I thought, let me see, I thought. Uh, okay, excellent. So if anybody has ever received an email from Mike Briggs, which a lot of you probably have, at the bottom of my emails, there's a hospice 101, and then there's a palliative care video. Those two videos show the differences between hospice care and, and palliative care. And really, palliative care can go on for three, four, five years. It can be a long stint where somebody's chronic, and they just need more hands on deck. And so we do palliative care through our house call program where Lenny or one of our nurse practitioners works closely with that patient. And then they work closely with an assist, um, sorry, with a home health provider to make sure that that patient is getting what they need. And then there comes a time where their diagnosis is such that they truly need hospice now. And then that's when hospice gets started. And hospice is really what we covered today. The main difference with palliative care is that uh, you don't get as many resources as you do with hospice and somebody can be on palliative care for a very, very long time. It can't, it's not just for six months or less. That's strictly the hospice benefit, but, but typically it's like a house call program partnering with a home health to provide that care or getting um, like D Childers on board to be the guardian and to be that senior advisor to help them um, so palliative care um, really is managing the signs and symptoms of their disease process. And, and they're not at the end of their life. They're, they're just, they have a chronic disease and they need assistance. And so that's where Keystone House Calls and um, either Horizon Home Health or Multicare Home Health or Touchmark or whoever, they work together to provide that palliative care. So if you have questions, you can unmute yourself and ask me a question. Hopefully I um, enlightened you on hospice and, and hopefully you understand that hospice is really about living uh, and not about dying. I know I certainly appreciated uh, Keystone. We use Keystone for both our mom and dad and the team is incredible. Um, even reaching out individually. And, and as I put in the chat, we love our bears. They're sitting in our living room <laughs> on the back of a chair. <laughs> The, the bears are extremely uh, special to the families, the grandkids, the children. It's a big deal. It is. Any questions, any of you? If not, Mike, I thank you so very much for your presentation today. It's incredibly helpful. It, it never ceases to amaze me how many people are confused by this incredible benefit and the fear. And, and I know that my sisters and I fell into the same bucket many years ago when 
our stepfather was dying and, and I just have so many regrets that I didn't tell my mom about hospice. You need to get them on board before the last few days because, you know, caregivers wear themselves out trying to take care of, of these folks that know that they're nearing the end of their life when there's experts, subject matter experts out there that can really help and help with that journey, even just bath aids and, and knowing and, and there's a nurse available to ask questions to. So it's really, um, unfortunately, I think a misunderstood benefit and, and it's my mission to help get it out there as well. So thank you so much for the expert presentation today, Mike. Absolutely, my pleasure, anytime.